Well, good morning, church. Welcome. We're so grateful to be with you this Sunday morning. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in a class um, on Wednesday nights. We're doing a Sermon on the Mount class, and there's some of us gathering. And our topic this week was just where your heart is, there is your treasure. And we were talking about different things that we treasure. And um, I definitely treasure a good cup of coffee. And so if you haven't had a chance to visit uh, Donna and Walter out at the coffee cart, it is pretty incredible. Um, but also just truly treasure uh, gathering together um, like we do on Sunday mornings. And so we uh, want to welcome you into this space together. Uh, we also invite you, if you've come prepared to give, um, we do have QR codes on the back of the chairs. You can scan that with your phones. Um, we also have connection boxes on your way out where you can give. Um, so would you guys join me just for a moment as we um, just welcome Christ in this space with us as we worship. So Father, thank you. Thank you that you're a God who treasures us that we get to be in community with you and with one another. As we worship this morning, would you be ever present as we sing? Would you be present in our message as, um, as we get to really think about how we treasure our time and use it, Father? We love you, we praise you, and all God's children said, amen.
know this song. So I'm going to ask you today to sing and pray these lyrics over your lives.
Well, good morning, and we just want to again say thank you and welcome. My name is Ashley Mutchler. I am the children's pastor here at Monta Vista Chapel, and we have a rhythm of gather, give, serve, and go. And typically in that rhythm, we have sharing guests that kind of follow along with that pattern. And so today is a Give Sunday. And so I have some friends up here because we have a really special opportunity to invite you all in to participate with us in the courtyard. So our children's ministry has partnered with Love Justice International for the last eight years. And in that partnership, we have raised money for Love Justice, specifically for Brad and Autumn Watt, who are serving in what country, girls? Nepal. Nepal. And is that close or far? Really far. And so they serve in Nepal, and we had an opportunity to have them come and speak and share with us last December. And in that time, we have decided to give our children's ministry some challenges throughout the year. And so this week, we are wrapping up our September challenge. Can, would one of you like to tell us what our September challenge is? It, it, it was... <laughs> It was to raise $2,000. $2,000 in the month of September. And so that is really exciting. So Danica, would you like to share how we are doing that today? We're going to be doing that. We're going to be uh, like bringing desserts. We're going to be doing art, selling like wands and other stuff like that. That's right. So our kids are putting on a marketplace in the courtyard right after church today. And these are all kid-made items. I should say most are kid-made items. And so we have great things from baked items to jewelry, little fairy wands, all kinds of things that the kids have made. And Sayla, would you like to share where is all this money going? To, to Nepal. We are sending it to Nepal. So not only are we benefiting Love Justice International, but we've also partnered with the Isaiah 58 University Fund. So as these children are being rescued out of human trafficking and slavery, um, they are then being sent, as they get old enough and they're educated, they're being sent to Europe to do a university program there so that they can become educated and then come back to Nepal and serve their community. And so the Isaiah 58 University University Fund is a great way for us to partner and just to uh, give back in a way that's really beautiful because as we know, God can bring beauty out of ashes. And so that's what we are here to do today. And so we're just asking church that you give generously and partner with us today as we can reach our goal of $2,000. Mr. Brad Watt is a little crazy as we kind of know, right? So what is he going to do, Danica, if we raise our $2,000? He's going to wax his eyebrows. He has promised to wax his eyebrows and videotape it for us. So our children's ministry will have a fun treat if we do earn that today. So thank you again for partnering with us. Um, I'm just going to ask our children to stand for the children's blessing this morning. So if you are elementary through junior high, you are going to be standing for a blessing. Today, uh, kids, it's going to be a little bit different. If you are in fifth or sixth grade, you are actually going to come with me instead of Vance, and we're going to go into the children's ministry building. All right. So if you, church, would just reach out a hand and help bless our kids. 
May you know that your heavenly Father loves you. May you know that in Jesus you have been accepted into God's family. May you set your hearts on things from above, the things that matter most to God. Love, forgiveness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and kindness. God has chosen you and calls you his child. As you go, may you be rooted in his redeeming love. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm excited about seeing what you have all made out there. That's going to be great. Uh, we were in staff meeting the other day, and uh, Ashley had shared that Brad was going to be waxing his eyebrows if he won, and I thought they were talking about our Brad. Um, and <laughs> Brad has really dark eyebrows, and I thought, oh my word, it's going to be crazy if that happens, but it's not. It's, it's Brad Watt. So anyway, well, it's great to be together, and uh, man, it's good to see the church continue to fill up as you return, and I just want to remind you, man, invite your friends and neighbors to Monta Vista. Look at the balcony, man. You guys are doing great up there. Hey, balcony, way to go. That's right. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to see everyone together. Well, today we are going to continue this series called Convivium, where we're looking at um, establishing a sustainable pace of life. And if you remember, we began by laying a foundation as we looked, a book, looked at the book of Genesis. And, and the foundation was kind of anch to anchor us in the fact that we are created a certain way. That we're created, first of all, out of community for community. So God has created us out of the Trinity so that we would be able to experience and uh, display his love to those around us, to God and to others. So we're created out of community for community, and we are created for a purpose. And that purpose is to bring God's good and just and his loving ways about. As we surrender to Christ and let Christ do his work in us, it moves through us out into the world. And so what the kids are doing today is participating in bringing that good and just kingdom about, right, as they uh, help with the sex trafficking issues uh, overseas. So um, in order to do that, though, we have to deal with, if we're going to find the sustainable pace of life, we have to do it in the midst of these relational circles. Remember we talked about each of us have like 35 relational circles that we need to somehow navigate if we're going to find that more sustainable, healthy pace of life. And so these three weeks, so last week, this week, and next week, we're going to be looking at some tricky areas to navigate. And last week, we began with the area of children. Like, how do we help our children, uh, depending upon their age and stage and development, to navigate life in a healthy way? What's an appropriate amount of activity? What's helpful for them in development? And so we took some time to look at that. And then this week, we are going to look at one that I know all of us wrestle with a bit, and that is technology. So I'd like to begin by doing something that maybe we don't think of very often, and that is to give a theology of technology. In other words, I want to help us understand technology in light of the grand biblical narrative. And to begin, I want to say this. Technology is a part of God's plan. Let me just say that again, because I think some of us will be disrupted by that statement. But technology is a part of God's plan. And I think that lines up with the great biblical narrative as well. And to unpack that, I'd like to begin with Genesis. Again, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, which reads this way. It says, Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. There he had put humanity. So the biblical narrative begins with a garden. And, and it's a garden that God has planted. So humanity had nothing to do with it. It was created ex nihilo, out of nothing. It was created by God for humanity. And so God puts that, uh, puts humanity in the garden to tend it. Now if we jump to the end of the story, Revelation, we see something quite different. In Revelation chapter 21 verse 2, we read this, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from 
God. And then later, if we continue to read that passage, we see that the tree of life is planted in the center of that city. And out of it, there's a river that flows, this river of life that comes from it. Um, So we see uh, that creation begins in a garden and it ends in a city. Now, what does that mean? What's that about? Well, again, I said the garden is created entirely by, okay, you're listening, thank you, and a city. How is a city made? Ah, humanity. It's an image in scripture of something that humanity creates, both for good and for ill, but the city is always an image of something that humanity creates, and not on their own, but in partnership with God. So God is the senior partner, right? And we come in and we join in what God is doing. So whatever this this new heaven and new earth is going to be, the image that God uses is a city. And part of that, I believe firmly, is because whatever it is, because we don't know a lot about what it's going to be like, but what it is is some cooperation between what we are building and growing here will have an effect into what eternity is is going to look like. And the image that God uses is a city. And a city is a place of technology. Now you may say, wait a minute, I don't know if that makes sense. Because most of us think of technology in what way? Yeah, cell phones, electronics. We think of technology as electronics. But that's not really the case. You see, um, there's so much more uh, to technology. Bricks and mortar, they were new ways to do things. Roads and buildings, gates, walls, roofs, all are technological developments that humanity, empowered by God, in partnership with God, brings to the table. So technology is a part of God's plan. In fact, it's assumed in Genesis chapter 128, which is called the creation mandate. It's this image we get in Genesis about what God's intention is for humanity. And again, we read this, be fruitful and increase in number, God says to Adam and Eve. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. See, God's plan for humanity is to steward It is to have dominion over creation. And technology is a part of that. Think about it. The development of the plow. It's a technological advancement. And what did it allow to have happen? That you could begin to till crops in the soil. And that you would be able to provide for more and more people. The wheel was something that could be used to transport goods so people can eat. And today, the development of medicines to heal the body or electronics so that I can have a conversation with my son and daughter-in-law who live uh, thousands of miles away, or I can have a FaceTime video conference with a missionary who lives in another country. Friends, technology is part of God's plan. He's not up in heaven wringing his hands going, oh, this thing got away from me and I don't know what to do with it now. It's actually a part of his plan. But here's the deal. Between the garden and the city in Revelation, the new Jerusalem, there's another building. Anyone want to guess what it is? It's found in Genesis chapter 11. It's called the Tower of Babel. Listen to verses 3 and 4. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Friends, do you see what just happened? This is the first time where we see in a very clear way technology being used in ways that are not aligned with God's good and beautiful plan. Because remember, what did... God tell humanity to do, to do what from the garden? Go out. But what did they want to do at the Tower of Babel? Oh, they wanted to stay in. Humanity decided to use technology, bricks of clay. That was a technological advancement. And mortar made of tar. Otherwise, they'd have to carve it out of stone and fit them together. 
And these huge technological advancements they used. And why did they use it? To defy God's plan. To stay in one place to make a name for who? Not for God, but to make a name for themselves. So here's the deal. Again, technology is a part of God's plan. And we as humanity can use it in both good and beautiful ways and in broken and destructive ways. Edward Friedman, uh, the author of a book that I continually return back to called The Failure of Nerve, talks about the reality that all technology, because of the fact we live in an emotionally regressive culture, which is all of us to some degree, and an emotionally regressive culture simply means we're not fully mature, right? We struggle emotionally and spiritually, that any technological advancement will be used for incredible good and for incredible ill, which is why we have nuclear medicine and the same science that developed nuclear medicine to heal people from cancer does what? It develops a bomb that can end life. Yeah. It's the same reason why we have uh, electronic technology to where my daughter and son, who are separated by a continent, can hang out and play a game together and laugh and enjoy time, and why we can have pornography available at the touch of a button. So the question then, friends, is how do we navigate this? Like, how do we navigate technology in such a way that we minimize the good and we, excuse me, maximize the good and minimize the bad? And so in order to do that, I'm going to invite Dr. Danielle Turley up to the platform again. And we're going to just talk a little bit about what that might look like. If you weren't here last week, uh, Danielle is a, uh, has her Ph.D. in family uh, development or human development and family systems. Um, I didn't say this last week, uh, but you are also married to Preston Turley, uh, who is our high school pastor. And uh, so, yeah, we just love you so much. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so... Yeah, let's go ahead and kind of start a little bit of that conversation. And uh, starting with the littles first, wh what are you talking about when we say technology? Because, again, I, I use the phrase technology to mean bricks and mortar and all that. We're not talking about that. So what are we talking about? Right. When we're talking about technology with our little ones, you've probably heard um, this phrase, screen time, right? That's largely what we talk about in terms of Think about your elementary age kiddos and younger. And that's because we're talking about kind of all of it together. We're talking about TV consumption, computer games, laptop games, um, the apps that they're on, uh, smartphones, all of it. We kind of talk about all of it together in terms of looking at what's beneficial and what's not so beneficial in yeah. terms of development and growth. Yeah, and so there's a lot of hype around screen time. If you're a parent, you use that phrase all the time, don't you? So is it all bad? Is it all horrible? Or is it good? What are, what are some of the dangers and stuff around it? Sure. We have um, established concerns a long time ago, starting when, when it was just TV that we were kind of worried about, right? What kinds of things are our kids watching? And some of the concerns um, started uh, with physical development because when our kids are on screens, they are sedentary, right? They're sitting and they're watching, not moving. They have an incredible amount of energy. I don't have to tell everybody that. But they do have this great need for a lot of physical movement. And when they are taking in more screen time, they're not getting the amount of movement that their physical bodies need, putting them at risk for things like overweight and obesity along with some of the messages they get from commercials and ads, which is usually, when it's targeted to our kids, full of sugar and fat and empty calories. So there's kind of the physical concerns that we have there, um, but there's also behavioral and social and emotional concerns even with our young kids. Yeah. Things like um, they're not getting a chance to practice what we call executive function. So the really hard things it takes to do, things like pay attention and ignore distractions and stay focused, we see that the more screen time that our kids are taking in, the harder time they have doing those things because they're not getting a chance to practice all of them. Mm. Yeah, and so is it all bad? And I think that's an important question because a lot of uh, Christians, we look at technology kind of from a, you got to just stamp it out. It's a mm -hmm. terrible thing. But the reality is it is part of God's plan. So is it all that bad? 
it's not all bad. We've seen with the advance of technology, we've seen some more interactive games and activities for even our young kids to do. And we've documented that it can be really good for academic skills, you know, ABCs, one, two, threes, colors, all that good stuff, but also social and emotional skills. You know, what does it mean to share? What does it mean to um, wait and listen? What does it mean to be angry and what do I do with those feelings? We've documented that kids can benefit in mm. that way when they're watching high quality programming. And there's a caveat, it takes an adult sitting next to them and watching the show and engaging with them. And that's because our kids learn best when they have that contingent direct response from a real adult. The TV can't do that. If even the best designed computer program can only do that to a certain degree. It really takes an adult yeah. there with them to talk about it and process that information. And we can see that it can really be awesome. But what is high quality and what does that mean? Um, when I say that, I'm talking about things like Sesame Street, things like Daniel Tiger, okay? So just about anything, not all of it, but just about anything you find on like PBS, those kinds of shows. Really something that's got a coherent storyline, something that um, isn't too overwhelming in terms of sensory overload, okay? So we want to avoid the things that are full of um, violence, avoid the things that are really fast-paced and quick-changing, anything that's kind of overload sensory. So the shorts that we're kind of finding on YouTube, um, even the shorts that now they're putting on Disney, they put like little two-minute shorts, right? And kids just watch and watch and watch and watch. Um, we want to avoid those because it's not great. There's a lot of things developing, and we just want to mm. not interfere with that. Yeah, yeah. So those are our littles, and I just, uh, as a parent, I, I think about the, the reality of sitting with our children when these kind of things happen. I know, as a parent, also the tendency to want to uh, use it as a babysitter, and, you know, sometimes that's a reality. Like, sometimes you've got to get stuff on the stove, and you need to do stuff. And so I want to be cautious about giving grace to one another through mm -hmm. this process, but to understand, really, um, the pros and the, the cons of this. So what about as they grow? What about as they get older? Yeah, so as we're shifting into adolescence, so just like we talked about last week, right, there's this big change. And there's also a change in how we talk about technology because now we're not really looking at developmentally how is technology influencing our teenagers, but it's more about safety, both yeah. their emotional safety, their social safety, and their physical safety. Um, and, and that's for a number of reasons, right? I needed to catch my place, excuse me. There's good things, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go the opposite yeah, way with yeah. our teens. I'm gonna talk about the good stuff first. Yeah. Um, because I told you last week, right, that social connections are so important for our teens. And we see in the, in the research that our teens have been able to connect more so with each other through the use of technology, right? It's, it's different, so maybe you and I did handwritten notes that we left in each other's lockers, but now it's text messages, now it's social media, it just looks different. Technology has even given some of our kids who are maybe more reserved and more shy and, and find it really hard to engage face to face. We find that they've actually, technology has been kind of like a way to scaffold them into building some social skills and engaging with peers when they weren't necessarily able to do it before. Identity seeking. Mm. It can also be a way, a safer way for our kids to try on some different personalities or to um, learn about some different interests that they might have in a little bit of a safer way that might not feel so intimidating in face-to-face -face context or things like that. But that is, right, where the muddies, uh, the water starts to muddy yeah. a little bit. The yeah. waters can get a little shark infested yeah. when we're talking about um, the social piece and the identity exploration and um, yeah. experimentation that happens online with our teens. So then what are some of the sharks we have to avoid or the landmines we need to stay uh, away from? Yeah, so we know that, that teens are engaging in social comparison when they're on social media platforms. And they and do that in kind of a very specific way. They do what we call, they, they compare up. So they're seeking out social influencers and things like this um, who are more attractive, more intelligent, more wealthy, more popular, more well-liked and they compare it to where they are and to themselves. And what this tends to do is it has implications for self-esteem, it has implications for body image, it has implications for confidence, um, and not just in little ways, we're talking about big serious ways, we're talking about it being linked to um, teenage girls specifically, um, 
having suicidal ideation and suicide attempts and highlighting social media specifically, but they're even able to put their thumb on it as, I don't feel good when I scroll uh, my newsfeed because I'm seeing these things and, right. and it makes me not feel good about myself. Yeah. It, I just want to add in here a second too. It's a reality for adults too. Yeah. Develop me, developmentally, it's, it's something we see in our teens, but we wrestle with it as adults too, don't we? Yeah. It's, it's also largely unmonitored territory. Mm -hmm. We, parents, loved ones, teachers, right? We're not in their social media feeds all the time. We're not in their text threads all the time. So it's a place where boundaries can be pushed and waters are tested. And that leads to a higher incidence of our teens being involved in things like cyberbullying, both the victim of and the perpetrators. It leads to more sexting. It leads to looking at pornography. When adults aren't around, our teens are more likely to do risky things, and especially when it comes to this technology world. Their brains are working against them developmentally at this point. Mm. We, uh, we're pretty familiar with the fact, right, that the prefrontal cortex, this decision-making part of our brain up front, is not fully developed until mid-20s. I feel like that's a pretty common thing we talk about a lot. But there's something else going on. One is their limbic system, so the part that's responsible for the emotions that they feel, is nearly fully mature at the beginning of puberty. Mm -hmm. So really high highs, really low lows, they feel things. They have the capacity to feel things really strongly, but they don't yet have the capacity to control those or not act on those. Also at the same time, the reward center of their brain is highly activated by the presence of, or even thinking that they have the presence of, their peers and their friends. What this means is, when they're around their peers, that reward center is lighting up, making risky decisions even more tempting. They really want to seek that out and act on it. It makes them more likely to make uh, less than stellar choices when they're around their peers. Mm. Now, luckily, right, it's not that way all throughout adolescence. It's gradually improving throughout their teen years, but it is something to be aware of. Even our most mature, most well-behaved teens have this going on, and it's important for us to be aware of, right? It's our job yeah. to protect them from themselves sometimes. Yeah. So, so then what do we do as parents? How do we come alongside and try to help and, yeah. Yeah, so for our teens, we talk about um, parental monitoring, and open communication. So parental monitoring, it's, it's not spying, it's not snooping, it's not doing things behind our teens' backs, but it's being involved, it's asking questions, it's having um, open conversation about, here's the freedom I'm going to allow, here's the responsibilities that come with it, um, here's why, right? And here's the consequences when, yeah. when those aren't met. It's just really being open about those conversations. Yeah. Um, there's other things to put in place, right? There's practical tools, things like apps and things like um, having controls over Wi-Fi, all that good stuff. But another thing is, is practically, right, not doing um, screen time, any kind of screen, and not allowing it in bedrooms. Mm. Um, it's largely unmonitored when it goes into a bedroom. And it's associated with all those things I mentioned earlier. When screens are in bedrooms, they're unmonitored which means our kids tend to get on them more often, and they might even be more likely to make some of those riskier choices in that space. Um, so it's just something to, to really, even with the little, little ones too, yeah. it's associated with things like not sleeping well, um, uh, overweight, obesity, things I mentioned earlier, just something about it going into that room seems to make it a little bit more of a risk for us and our kids. So, so parents, um, I'll, I'll be the bad guy here. You can tell your kids that your pastor said, not that I have a lot of weight in this, but that your pastor said it's maybe okay for you to monitor their cell phones. It's okay for you as parents not to spy, to have open conversation with them, treat them with dignity, but it's okay to say, hey, I'm going to have this and I can look at your phone as anytime I want. And it's also okay to say to your kids um, and adults and spouses, no uh, screens in bedrooms. Like th there's that's okay for us to say. I think sometimes we don't even know what to do, so we just let it happen. And so, I'm not saying you have to say that, but it's absolutely okay to do that. And studies seem to show that that's quite helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And also afterwards, I just want to say we are going to have some time where Vance Yarborough, our junior high pastor, is going to meet anyone who wants to, ha- to learn a little bit more. And it's just going to be 15 minutes with a great handout to give you some info about how to help with some apps and how to do internet monitoring and security and all that kind of stuff. He's going to meet you in the travertine room. I'll be there too. But just a few minutes to kind of give you some skills in that area because I know as parents it's, it's overwhelming. So are there other specific um, uh, recommendations for establishing healthy family? Anything else? Yeah, there, the American Academy of Pediatrics has some specific recommendations for children, so think teenagers and younger. Um, and they just divide it into two simple rules. For our kiddos that are two years old and younger, their recommendation is zero. Wow. No screens. Um, there's a lot of brain development happening in those first two years that's really contingent on having the face-to-face interaction with people, and there's no benefit that's been documented at all with screens um, with those little ones. And then older than two, we're, we're talking about less than two hours a day is the recommendation, which is a little bit harder. We're not talking about two hours a day at home, right? Now we have the screens that they're taking in at school to consider and and include in that um, time as well. So just to kind of be aware of the amount of time they're on screens and trying to limit it and observing it with them, right? Doing all that good stuff to try and increase the good and decrease the bad. Yeah. And you can on all of the phones. So you have the ability to track what kind of time has been spent on that device with what type of programs open. Um, it's not a difficult thing to do. Vance can give you a little bit of insight into that, but you can see that. And, and I'm going to talk about this in just a moment, but even us as adults need to be aware. It could be shocking if you open your phone and say, how much time do I spend online? Um, my guess is most of us would be uh, deeply, deeply shocked. So I want to just turn the conversation then um, to us as adults for just a few moments, or I I don't know, it's not going to be a conversation, I guess, anymore. I'm going to do a little monologue as we close. Um, But uh, it's it's also something we as adults need to be aware of as well. And Kelsey uh, Henderson gave me a book that she... Uh, read in her program, uh, Organizational Leadership Masters. Um, That's called uh, 12 Ways Your Cell Phone is Changing You. And it's actually a good entry place for a conversation around what technology does. It's called 12 Ways Your Cell Phone is Changing You. And I'd encourage you as adults to read. It's written from a Christian perspective, which is hard to find. Uh, Most Christian uh, uh, writers oftentimes just say stop, which doesn't really work. We can't repress that. We need to learn how to deal deal with it well. And it deals with things like um, our growing uh, addiction to distraction, like it's difficult even for adults to focus anymore. Our craving for immediate approval, like how many times does an adult put something on the internet and then watch to see how many people have viewed or watched or liked or clicked it or stuff like that. Um, Increasing levels of FOMO, uh, fear of missing out. Uh, where you see somebody at a gathering and you go, oh, I wasn't invited. That's not just a a teenage thing. It's an adult thing that goes on. And yet all of this reality about interacting on social media, we are finding that since 2007 there is a study that you watch the graph and and the social uh, activity after 2007 is when the iPhone is introduced. You see the graph take off as far as social media use and you see the loneliness scale do the same thing. So we have an increasing level of loneliness despite the fact that we are more socially connected via uh, our devices than ever. And then we get comfortable, and, and this is a significant one as well, we get comfortable with secret devices, uh, secret vices, sorry, on our devices. Uh, secret vices where we can do things online that we're not aware, that others aren't aware of. And so to have your your... Um, screens in a place where it's public is not a bad idea. In fact, I would encourage it. It's, it's, It's intelligent. So this issue of technology is something that all of us need to wrestle with. How do we work our way through it? How do we, like Danielle said, increase the the flourishing side of it because it's part of God's plan? And how do we minimize the broken parts of it? And so I just want to close with two kind of encouragements or challenges. And the first is this, because technology is a part of God's plan, uh, rather than this all good or all bad perspective that we tend to have, a lot of times all bad, just get rid of it, I want to invite you to ask yourself the question, is the technology that I'm using 
in line with the good and just and beautiful kingdom God is wanting to build through me. Because here's the deal, technology is an extension of us, right? It's the, the digital technology is an extension of us. And so what you're scrolling through, what you're posting, what you're reading, what you're watching, is it something that, that you go, oh, this is bringing that shalom of God's good and just and beautiful kingdom to bear in me and through me? Ask yourself that question, and my guess is it'll modify, it'll modify our perspective of what we'll use. It's just the first thing, because technology is a part of God's plan, is it in line with his plan? Ask yourself that question. And the second thing I would encourage is to fast from, t uh, from social media or technology, because when something becomes um, ubiquitous, when something becomes like just the air we breathe, we don't even know what's, what it's doing when it's doing it which is why we fast from food once in a while, because it makes us understand, oh, I'm eating because I'm bored or because I'm lonely. It makes us think about those things. It's why we fast from television or from, if we're talkers, we fast from words because we can use them. They're meant for good. We can use them in really broken ways. And so when we fast from technology, it actually surfaces the things that we are looking to technology for that really are meant to be found in other places. So I'd encourage you, start with a couple of hours, start with a day, maybe a week. See if you can limit for a while, not because technology is bad, but because sometimes we get caught in the swirl and end up using it in some really inappropriate ways. So two questions as we go from here, um, or two encouragements. The first is to really ask the question, is this technology in line with God? Like, would he smile when he sees you participating and using technology in the way you are? Would he go, man, look at that. They are carrying out the creation mandate. And then second, just to be aware of fast. Take some time and step away and see what God might do. Danielle, do you have anything else you want to share as we wrap up? Okay. I want to say thanks to Danielle again. Can we thank her for, yeah. And I'm going to close in a word of prayer, and then we will uh, give our parting blessing. So God, thanks for uh, this space today. Thanks for the reality that you have made us creative people. And uh, we are inventive and curious, and because of that, incredible things can happen. Um, technology, even in the last 50 years, has been overwhelming what has happened. And there are so many good things that come from it, and... Just like the Tower of Babel, there's some broken things that come, a lot of broken things. So God, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom to know how to deal with this. Give us courage to draw boundaries and help our children through this. Give us courage to do some self-examination in our own lives. Give us the ability to be honest with ourselves and with those that are around us. And God, we pray that this morning we'll just contribute a little bit to your good and just and loving kingdom moving forward. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. I just want to remind you again, in the travertine room in about five minutes, um, Vance is going to be out there and we'll be sharing just a little bit about technology and some real practical. He'll have a handout that gives you all the things because we, we can't. Like, we're not going to be able to give you all the information. Uh, it's already out there. We're just going to direct you to where that's at. Also want to encourage you to participate out in the courtyard with all the stuff that's going on with our littles. Uh, man, let's uh, be sure that uh, next week that Brad Watts has no eyebrows, okay? <laughs> Would you receive the parting blessing? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. go in God's grace.